All right, so tonight's special guest speaker, Adam Schaefer, is an epidemiologist at Florida Atlantic University's Harbor Branch Oceanographic Institute. Adam holds a master's in public health and epidemiology from St. Louis University and has more than 50 scientific publications to his name. Since joining Harbor Branch in 2008, Adam has conducted a broad range of research projects focused on the health of the Indian River Lagoon and its inhabitants. Tonight, Adam's gonna tell us a pretty interesting story focused on the potential links between environmental health, wildlife health, and maybe even human health. It's with great pleasure that I introduce Adam Schaefer. <clears throat> all right, thanks again, man. Can everybody hear me? All right, first of all, let's give Zach a big round of applause for organizing this year's lecture series. And uh, thank you for coming out. It's a pleasure to, to be the last in the series this year. Um, and uh, I want to give a little bit of a different talk than you probably usually see. My background is not in marine biology or ecology. I'm an epidemiologist by training. So uh, raise your hand if you know what epidemiology is or what an epidemiologist does. There's a few. Because I, I get this a lot. Some people think epidemiology is the study of skin and skin diseases. And I do get the occasional person that wants to show me a weird rash they have. I can't diagnose it. I had an aunt that really ruined Thanksgiving one year, and I don't want to leave that, relive the uh, no eye contact Christmas we had. But um, I want to make it clear because it, it's going to be important in kind of setting the stage with the story I'm going to tell. So what epidemiology really is, it's the basics of disease and health over large populations. So think of the who, what, why, when, where of disease. Uh, the most famous example is this teeny tiny map here. Uh, this is from a cholera outbreak that happened in London. And actually, the person who's considered the father of epidemiology, his name is Jon Snow. He's not the Game of Thrones character. He's an actual physician who ended up tracing back these cases of cholera to one specific pump handle in or on Broad Street in London that was the cause of this cholera outbreak. And he found this and realized that the water being pumped to that one station was actually being pumped from downriver, downriver of human contamination, livestock contamination. So all these folks were getting an environmental exposure, a pathogen, and causing a lot of disease. And that, that example is, is pertinent to some of the things we're going to talk about tonight. So epidemiology is originally designed in all the, the theories and practices for studying human health. So what I've done in, in my work, in my career, is actually take those methods and apply it to a different population. Uh, so we're talking about a variety of different species, like dolphins. Uh, recently, we've been doing some shark work, as well as working on endangered African penguins. So these are, again, the same concepts that we use to study human disease. My background, I used to work at a human hospital. Uh, actually, so I switch to, to patients that don't tend to complain as much when you stick them with a needle. <laughs> Although these guys are a little, a little bitier than others. So again, the, the whole concept of epidemiology is connecting the, the host, and in this case we're going to talk a bit about marine mammals, that the pathogen or the toxin or the exposure and the environment. Now when we're talking about connecting these things, we have wildlife health and human health and we're really interested in these shared exposures, the environment and the pathogens and toxins and contaminants that are in that environment, in this case, the Indian River Lagoon. Now, that looks really simple, right, in theory? Well, in practice, it's a little bit more complex, right? Now, I'm not going to quiz you on all the details of this, but I want to make it, make it clear that we're, we're looking at multiple inputs and multiple outcomes in one shared environment. Uh, which is why there's no one simple, easy answer to some of these things. So when uh, you ask me a question later on, if it seems like I'm dodging it, I'm not quite dodging it. Uh, I'm just trying to put it in the context of these really complex interactions that we're dealing with. So let's jump to uh, the dolphin health work, which is going to be the focus of, of most of my talk here. Uh, you probably know we have a population of wild dolphins in the Indian River Lagoon. Uh, most of them, or a lot of them, are known residents. We have a photo ID program at Harbor Branch where they follow these animals, so we know where they're hanging out with, who they're shacking up with, um, whose baby daddy is who, and all these really complex 
social interactions that all play a really important role when it comes to health and disease, especially spreading infectious diseases, for example. And we've had our stranding and our live health assessments. So in a lot of cases, we're able to follow these individual animals from birth all the way to death, uh, which again makes a really nice data set where we can do a lot of interesting things with it. Now, a lot of that data also comes from live animal capture. So this program is called the Dolphin Health and Environmental Risk Assessment. Uh, it's been going on for uh, over 10 years. We just got our, our last five-year permit, so we'll at least be sampling for 15 years, sampling live dolphins in the lagoon uh, and following these guys over a long period of time. And the study was originally designed to look at the factors affecting the health of bottomless dolphins. And then somewhere in the middle of this project, actually pretty early on, they ended up hiring me uh, to provide kind of the epidemiology perspective of putting these multiple streams of data together, integrating environmental data to get some big picture answers when it comes to dolphin health. So what we found are a lot of interesting things. So what I'm going to do for the rest of the talk is highlight a couple of these that are also important to human health. So I'm going to talk about these last few here. But we have seen some interesting things like uh, these papilloma lesions. So these are symmetrical lesions on the tongue of the dolphins. Now what's interesting about those is that we also see those kind of symmetrical lesions in HIV AIDS patients, human patients, right? So what we know and what we've seen is that a lot of these animals have markers for immune dysfunction causing some of these symptoms like these, these lesions. We were also the first to report a West Nile virus in dolphins. Uh, we found exposure to a variety of arboviruses. Those are mosquito borne viruses that we're, we're concerned about. We see them in dolphins. Uh, there's a lot of potential routes of transmission and why they're exposed, but it was a new finding. And then I'm going to run through these for just kind of, kind of briefly to give you an overview and, and how these things connect to human health. Now, the first one I brought up today because in the southern IRL, in this area, we see this fungal skin disease in the highest prevalence in the IRL. It's called lobomycosis. Sometimes it's called lachesiosis or paracoccidioides mycosis. So I hope I use enough big words for tonight. And what this is, is a really interesting disease because we only see it in humans and dolphins. So it's only been observed in bottlenose dolphins. So this, this map, which is a little hard to see, I apologize, the numbers represent human cases. The letters represent dolphin cases. So you can see the clustering in right down here, primarily in the Brazil area. But we see it in dolphins in the lagoon. Again, like I said, mostly in the southern IRL. And they present with these cutaneous cauliflower-like lesions. And these animals can have them for years and years. It doesn't necessarily kill them. And the same happens with humans. Now, this is the least kind of icky photo, human photo I could find. Uh, with a gentleman with the same, same lesion here on his ear. A lot of folks get them on their extremities and their feet and their legs as well. And this is primarily endemic to, again, we're talking um, South America and certain areas of the Amazon. It's actually pretty bad. So these are the two cases here. These are the cells causing the dolphin disease, and these are the cells causing the human disease. Again, it's hard to tell with this photo, but from a morphological standpoint, just by their, their shape and size, they're almost identical. But through our work, we've actually found that these are, are both completely different diseases that are both related to a root human disease called uh, Paracoccidioides brasiliensis. But the interesting thing about both of these, these, these diseases, these pathogens, is that we can't grow them in culture or in a lab. So there's a lot of things we don't know about this disease, how to treat it, for example, or where it is in the environment. So we have trouble actually preventing it in human cases. So what we've been doing with our dolphin work is we're just writing up the complete uh, genome sequence of the dolphin disease. And we're designing a molecular probe. So basically, uh, a way to look into the environment to look for these cells, oops, to look for the cells to find out where they grow the most, what environmental conditions promote growth and inhibit growth and then eventually use those tools and apply them to the areas where we're seeing it in humans to do uh, some public health work in terms of warning uh, individuals where the hot spots are or what certain conditions they need to avoid in order to, to avoid being uh, 
infected because there's no treatment for this disease in humans. They just excise or remove the lesion and hope it doesn't grow back. Uh, so we're actually using our dolphin work to further public health. Now another big one, which is obviously all over the news that a lot of folks are familiar with, is antibiotic resistance. Uh, again, this is something that I did quite a bit when I worked at a human hospital looking at resistant infections and nosocomial or hospital-acquired infections. So what we found with our dolphin sampling, again, we're talking about dolphins in the lagoon, is we found a whole variety of antibiotic-resistant pathogens that are colonizing these dolphins. Now that's interesting because they're not taking antibiotics. They shouldn't have a lot of these interesting antibiotic resistance patterns in these, these bacteria that we see. In fact, some of the, the patterns are the kinds of things I used to see in the human hospital. So we actually cultured MRSA, which I'm sure folks are familiar with, uh, from a couple of our IRL dolphins. Obviously E. coli, we know that's everywhere. And a couple of emerging hospital-acquired infections of concern. So Actinobacter bumini, and uh, this is a, a ruginosa, which actually causes a lot of ventilator-associated pneumonias as well. So we saw this in the dolphins. So that raises a lot of questions of what the heck's going on in the lagoon. Because again, we know the dolphins aren't being prescribed antibiotics. So where does it possibly come from? Well, there's a couple different routes. First, these resistant bacteria can directly get transferred into the lagoon through things like wastewater treatment and, and other human activities. And then there's also selection in the environment. So there could be antibiotics getting into the environment, causing what we call selective pressure. So basically, the resistant bacteria in this example, they're exposed, right? Those guys survive, and then they reproduce and proliferate, and then you're almost breeding these superbugs. And those things can be uh, changed or altered by different changes in the environment. So changes in salinity, even heavy metals and mercury have been associated with some of the genes that are also associated with antibiotic resistance. So it's a really interesting and complex problem. Another example of, again, how it gets into the environment, I know there's a lot, a lot of things going on here in this, this figure, but again, there's multiple routes of exposure. So this is also just pharmaceutically active compounds in general. And the fact is, a lot of sewage treatment processes don't break down antibiotics or pharmaceutical drugs. So they get in through wastewater treatment, they get in through uh, aquaculture, for example. We don't really necessarily have this a big of an issue here. Uh, and farms are also another source of some of these. And then this little gentleman who's expelling his resistant microbes right there in the middle of the watershed. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of potential routes here. So we wanted to look at just a few of the possibilities. So we selected just one pathogen. So we're talking about antibiotic-resistant E. coli. And we wanted to overlay where we saw dolphins with this resistant bacteria with a whole variety of environmental uh, pieces of data. So one of them was population density up and down the lagoon. So these are our census tracts that are, that are laid over here. And then sewage treatment sites. None of those were associated with our antibiotic-resistant E. coli, but we did find a temporal trend. So about 2005, 2006, there was an increase. As you, if you've lived here, you probably know that coincided with some uh, hurricane events. And then we also saw that some of the areas with the highest older septic systems uh, tended to have a higher incidence of uh, antibiotic-resistant E. coli. So this, again, is an example how we took something that's, again, a threat to human health and to dolphins and, and combined those data sets to start to look at a bigger picture. And we're still working on a publication that's in review looking at the temporal trends of antibiotic-resistant pathogens in the lagoon, and hopefully that'll be coming out in the next year or so. So let's switch gears to another uh, environmental contaminant that I've done quite a bit of work on, and that's mercury. So mercury, just as a quick primer, it's ubiquitous. It's uh, deposited all over the world, and it comes, comes from multiple sources. So this is a real simplistic kind of diagram where we have waste incineration, some mining processes, especially gold mining, uh, and even some power plants can release mercury into the atmosphere. And once elemental mercury is in the atmosphere, it can travel hundreds, thousands of miles before it gets deposited, and it's particularly Interesting when it, or not really interesting, but bad, 
when it gets deposited into aquatic environments, especially like the Indian River Lagoon, where once we have elemental mercury, it biomagnifies and bioaccumulates in the environment. So what happens is it gets transformed through bacteria, which are just some dots here, and they get transferred into methylmercury, which is the form of mercury we're really concerned about. And it starts to accumulate up the food web. So you have smaller fish, they get eaten by bigger fish, yada, yada. Then eventually we get up to dolphins and even humans. So the higher you are in the food web, the higher the concentration of mercury tends to be. So things, uh, critters like sharks and dolphins are particularly interesting for some of our studies. And we're worried about mercury because in a lot of cases, exposure, especially to high concentrations of mercury, can be harmful. So in adults, a really, really acute dose can cause things like ataxia. So we're talking about tremors and uh, issues with uh, neurological symptoms. And that's actually where the term mad as a hatter came from. Now, they used to use mercury in the felting process of hats. So over time, these hatters were uh, ex exposed to higher concentrations of mercury, and they started to develop these neurological symptoms uh, that are now synonymous with, with the hatter. But more importantly, we're interested and in, in concerned about exposure of uh, developing fetus and young children. They tend to have neurodevelopmental delays, delays in speech uh, and mobility issues down the line uh, if they have prenatal exposure to mercury. So, from our dolphin work, we found that the dolphins in the IRL have some of the highest concentrations of mercury that have ever been reported in the species. Yeah, a little doom and gloom, right? So there's the IRL, there's Sarasota Bay, there's Charleston, South Carolina, a comparison site that we also do some sampling at. And you can see how much higher the concentrations are. Now then, the, the logical question is why, where does it come from? Well, there's, there's a couple reasons for this. First of all, uh, atmospheric deposition of mercury, which continually is monitored, is high in Florida. So right over us, that's the red, that's what that means. Uh, it's high atmospheric deposition. A lot of that has to do with air movement and air sheds. Uh, but we also have a really nice environment in the lagoon for methylation, for the bacteria that actually biotransform mercury. Uh, there's a ton of them in the lagoon, and they tend to, to methylate it really efficiently. And then, of course, we also have things like prey selection, what the dolphins are eating, also play a role in the mercury concentrations that they have. So once we saw this, immediately that raises red flags, right? High concentrations in the dolphins, so what does that mean to the environment and humans in the same area? Well, first off, we started to look at a variety of dolphin prey species. This isn't a, obviously a comprehensive list, but we wanted to look at spatial patterns. So where is it highest and why? And we found that with some of these species, we saw higher concentrations in this orange segment right here. So that's a northern IRL. And that's not a shock because there's not a ton of water movement. Uh, a lot of stuff kind of accumulates there. So we saw higher concentrations in both the dolphins and some of the fish species. And we also saw concentrations in this area that were a little higher too, you can see on this graph, uh, among their prey species. So we went from the dolphins to the fish. Well, we saw high concentrations in the fish. So the next logical step is, what about the people who are eating the fish? So I started another study where we went out and sampled recreational fishermen. Uh, people who lived along the IRL and routinely fished from the IRL. So we asked them a variety of questions. What they're eating, the specific species, how often, where they're coming from, some background information for us to do some more advanced epi work. And we found that local residents who were consuming IRL food, or fish primarily, um, had higher concentrations compared to other similar studies. So just like the dolphins, we saw high concentrations uh, compared to similar studies, we saw it with the, with the humans as well. So 1.5 parts per million is not enough to kill you, um, but it is a concern. And it, it, again, it does show that, that parallel between the dolphin uh, and the humans. So we did find that individuals who were eating uh, locally caught seafood uh, three times a week or, or even once more a day here had a higher concentration. So we saw a nice, what we call an epi, a dose response relationship. So the more you're eating it, the higher the concentration is. And that led to another study, which we're currently writing up, 
and we did in collaboration, or I did in collaboration, with a couple of local physicians. So we went out and worked with physicians to sample pregnant women. Again, what I mentioned earlier, the most sensitive population are the developing fetus and young children. So we wanted to take it a step further and sample pregnant women in the area to find out, again, what they're consuming, where it comes from, how often, but also link it back to what they know about the risk and the benefits of seafood consumption and how that relates to their behavioral changes. So we, again, we talk this, this concept right from the dolphins all the way to really the end point of the most susceptible population. And we had some really important findings from that that we're hoping to share and have peer reviewed again in the, in the next few months, actually. So then, obviously, we're in Stewart, right? Let's talk a little bit about algal blooms. Now, I don't have a lot of data to present here because these are fairly new and, again, ongoing studies. But some of the work, again, with, with the wildlife work that I've done, we've been going out and sampling uh, dolphins and sharks. We're also doing some work with rays and uh, starting to do some prey species work as, to, as well. So we want to figure out how these harmful algal bloom toxins, and, and let's be really specific, what I'm talking about right now are the bloom-green algae, so the microcystin, where we want to know the health effects and, and how it's accumulating in apex predators. So we've been sampling dolphins, if they strand, if we're able to get our hands on them, uh, which luckily we haven't had large stranding events in this area, uh, and sharks and rays, which is why I have a little bit of a sunburn. We were out all last week sampling uh, sharks and rays, both in this area and the northern IRL. Because, again, we want to know, are these toxins accumulating up the food web? Uh, how are they accumulating, and what are the ultimate health effects? So we've been working on this project through some funding through the Harbor Branch Foundation and our Center for Coastal and Human Health. So again, there's, there's not a ton of data to, to, to share right now, but this has been an ongoing effort that, that we're continuing to be engaged in and uh, follow over the long period. But again, apex predators, right? Well, what about humans? So this is another study that we've been doing uh, that we just recently started. And actually, we're in collaboration getting some technical assistance with, with the CDC. So one of the issues with the microcystin is that we don't have a reliable clinical test to actually measure exposure. So when we start to talk about what are the health effects or what are the long-term health effects, the first step is figuring out how to measure the toxin. That's actually been a bit more challenging than, than you would think. So we started sampling individuals, and some of you probably participated in our study, some of you here. So we, we did a small pilot study right now, and we're hoping to obtain uh, a larger grant to actually continue it and do long-term monitoring. But we started sampling uh, individuals. So there's a couple different tissues we wanted to look in. So we took nasal swabs. Uh, we asked for urine samples as well as a blood sample. Because again, we don't even know what the best tissue to measure this toxin is. So we've been working with the CDC to basically develop a new test. So we've been doing nasal swabs. We started asking questions again with these, these surveys, uh, very specific questions about exposure. So where people were exposed, when, um, for how long, were they eating any seafood, to answer some of these really important questions. And we're combining that with some of the other research going on at our Center for Coastal Health, where we can tie it directly to the concentrations of the toxins in the water. So we're hoping to be able to model concentration in the water, what does that relate to a nasal swab or a blood sample, for example, and then build long-term studies to answer what are the health effects of those exposures. It's a very complex question, and there's no easy solution. But we're working, again, with, with a lot of different partners, with our nursing college as well, to do this sort of sampling, to build the critical data set that we need to answer some of these questions, and both for the human health component, but also to inform policy. So again, hopefully very soon, actually I had a conference call with the CDC last week, uh, we'll actually have some results and uh, move forward with getting things peer-reviewed, and then we can, we can share everything with the public. So I rambled a lot, right? What does all this stuff mean? What do all these exposures mean? Well, really, we're talking about using uh, predators in the environment, whether it's a shark, whether it's a dolphin. Um, we want to use them as a sentinel, because what we're seeing and what we've demonstrated with some of our data we're seeing these impacts, these human impacts on wildlife, but now we're starting to see those impacts 
circle right back around to affect human health. So what we've been doing is closing the loop between wildlife and human health. And dolphins are a really good barometer because, first of all, we know they live uh, a fairly long time. We have photo ID programs that can follow them. We know they feed at the top of the food web. And for dolphins, in particular, with their blubber layer, will actually store certain contaminants long term. So we can look at kind of a lifetime of exposure versus just one particular period of time. And then we know they inhabit some of the same coastal areas as we do. They share some of the same exposures, so they swim in the water that we swim in. They eat some of the fish species that we eat. And again, it's, it's all connected to human health. And I, again, I talked a lot of, uh, about many different projects, and it's really important to point out that, again, as, a, as an epidemiologist, our work is very collaborative. Uh, we work hard to integrate large data sets to get real-world answers. So it takes a lot of great collaborators, uh, folks from Harbor Branch, from other universities, from NOAA, uh, Florida Fish and Wildlife, as well as our, our, our physician partners, uh, to pull off some of these long-term studies. So I'd like to say we a lot when I give lectures. It's not that I'm talking about the royal me or I have voices in my head. It's that we really have a large team of collaborators to pull some of these studies off. And with that, I know I ran through a lot of stuff pretty quickly, but I figure we're going to have a lot of great questions tonight, so I want to give you plenty of time to ask. Uh, and I do have to give uh, a mention that a lot of the dolphin work has been funded through the Protect Wild Dolphins license plates, uh, and those are administered by the uh, Harbor Branch Foundation. And if you have more questions, we try to update our social media stuff with our projects and field work, uh, so there's that information as well. So with that brief and large overview, now we can have the fun part where we can start uh, some questions. So who wants to, or, or no questions, we can just go straight to happy hour. Yeah, sure. and if there are a question I can't answer, I'm just gonna call on Zach in the back, so. <laughs> so we'll start right there in the orange. Mm -hmm. Having said that, I'd like to ask you, would you eat fish out of the Indian River Lagoon? <laughs> so the question is a loaded question. Uh, it's, would I eat fish out of the Indian River Lagoon? It really depends on the species. Uh, you know, some of the larger trophic level species versus the ones kind of on the bottom of the food web, uh, that's, that's what dictates what kind of contaminant loads they're going to have. Uh, personally, I really just like to eat salmon, so I wouldn't eat a ton of IRL. Obviously, we don't have salmon in the IRL. Um, but I wouldn't say they're dangerous to eat. It's all about moderation and, and being careful what species you eat and how often. That's what our studies have really shown. And I guess, we, yeah, we'll do a follow-up. Triple tail, black drum, sheep's head. Sheep's head. So would I eat triple tail, black drum, or sheep's head? Zach's the fisherman, um, but... Uh, I don't really eat, I eat sheep's head. I, I wouldn't see them because of what they feed on. I don't. Triple tail. I ate triple tail for dinner last night. But it was an ocean caught triple tail, not an Indian River Lagoon triple tail. Do I know that it didn't spend any time in the estuary? You guys know I do fish tracking work. And I know that if, you know, a lot of these fish make huge migrations. Maybe it did, maybe it didn't. But I feel a lot better eating coastal and offshore fish than I do eating our, our Indian River Lagoon species. And I hope that gives you at least somewhat of an answer to your question. And he brings up, Zach brings up some really important points. And what we're trying to do in building large data sets, which is very, very difficult to, to fund, is we want to look at the chronic health implications of some of these exposures. Unfortunately, those are really difficult to get funding to do and to do correctly and continuously. But it's what we need, uh, both for the algal blooms, some of the chemical to contaminant exposures that we have, and then, of course, Another way to answer your question, too, these are what we know, at least when it comes to mercury, uh, some of the fish species that are low and high. So from that, thanks, Zach. Um, we're right there. That's, that's correct. The, the higher predatory fish, so you can see on that list, swordfish, marlin, for example, uh, those tend to have the higher concentrations. In theory, yeah. You know, the nickname for Big King Mackerel is Mercury Missiles, for a very good reason. <laughs> there we go, right in the back. Yep. I know there's a law in Florida about residents being very conscientious about not eating phosphate and fertilizers on their lawns, particularly in the summer, mm -hmm. because it contributes to the algae blooms. Is there any way that we as residents, as voters, can uh, contest or 
So, so the question is, what can you do as citizens, uh, particularly when we're talking about uh, the use of phosphates with golf courses and, and other folks that are actually exempt? You can certainly reach out to your, your lawmakers and, and organizations like FOS and folks like Zach in the back of the room are, are great advocates for those sorts of things, and those are the kind of folks to, to talk to. So I just keep pawning everything off. Well, and uh, we're, we're at a very special time right now. For the first time ever, we've seen political momentum in the right direction. You know, if you look back at 2016's elections, we had a horrible environmental year in 2016. Big discharges, algae blooms. There wasn't one political ad on TV that talked about the environment. This past cycle in 2018, every single politician from, from county commission right up to Congress talked about the environment. So this is the kind of time where we have leaders that are trying to make the environment their priority. So as constituents, as voters, as visitors to our area, now is the time to pick up the phone, call your county commission, call your state representatives, call your, your senator or congressperson, and tell them your thoughts. Let them know why it matters to you as somebody who lives in Florida, who eats seafood, who recreates near the water, who just cares about the environment in general. It doesn't seem like little voices matter, but boy, in the last two years, I've seen the additive power of all of our voices combining to change politics in Florida, and it's moving in the right direction. You know, we have a long road ahead of us, but the kind of comments that you just mentioned, talking to your politicians, they really do make a difference. All right, here in front. That likely has, that plays a role. It's, it's a couple different factors. So the question is, uh, when we so, see different species, or different, different dolphin populations have different concentrations of mercury, is because of they're feeding on different species of fish. And the answer is that that is part of the explanation, is differences in their feeding ecology. Even, even controlling for that, we still see higher concentrations in the IRL dolphins. We'll go right to the back in the blue there. Okay, so the question is, uh, what's the effect of the algal bloom toxins on the dolphins, and how does that, that correlate with human health? The answer is, we don't really have a good grasp on the health effects of the dolphins. Now, I will say that we, have, we didn't see massive die-offs of dolphins during these blue-green blooms. Like, on the other coast, during the red tide, massive marine mammal mort mortalities occur. But here we just, we don't see it. So it's probably a more subtle, chronic effect. So that's why we're really interested, especially in the liver. So we know that microcystin is a hepatotoxin, so it concentrates in the liver. It can cause some health effects there. So we're really just trying to build enough data to understand what the effects are. We know they're not getting exposed to high enough doses for an acute death. But that doesn't mean that there aren't going to be long-term effects. And it's the same. Same with the human health question. We don't have a great grasp on it. We're still building that data. Um, but one of the really interesting questions is, what is it doing long term? Oh, that's, that algae question probably spurred a lot of folks right now. So, so, the questioner's thoughts on the, the neurotoxicity and the issues with, with the blooms and the populations that live near chronic blooms in, in particular. There's a lot of work that needs to be done when it comes to exactly what toxins are being produced in these blooms. Uh, all these blooms are different. So some of the environmental conditions are different that actually cause these cells to release different toxins. So we're still working with our, our chemistry, our organic chemistry folks at Harbor Branch, to figure out what compounds are actually being produced in these blooms. There could be things that are way more harmful or, or doing more harm that we don't even know about. So it's really tough to pinpoint one particular uh, toxin like BMA and the role of that that's playing, because we don't know the full scale of what's being produced. Now, yeah, there are, there are some hypotheses that are out there um, regarding the role of BMA and things like ALS and Alzheimer's. 
um, based on some anecdotal evidence from some other studies in other countries. So we're still, still working to build that, measure those toxins, and look at the cumulative effects. And, and like I mentioned with the microcystin, some of these things are very difficult to measure and measure accurately. So we want to be very careful the kinds of claims we make with some of these, these compounds that are out there uh, to make sure that we're not getting people concerned for no reason or to make sure we're not missing something. It's really a complex issue. So that's why our chemistry group is, has been working for quite a while to try to figure out exactly what they're doing and then test some of those compounds on cell lines, different human cell lines, again, to give us a bigger picture. Because again, we, we don't know. And if these blooms are continuing annually, are they producing the same toxin every year? And to what level? Uh, those are just so many unknowns that we're continuing to try to address. I wish I had more answers, and that's, that's why we're pushing so hard to do some of these studies. But it's a great question, really important. Let's go right here in the front. Uh, so part of this list also has to do with sustainable practices. So um, some areas aren't as sustainable as others when it comes to shrimp farming. Uh, in the U.S., it just tends to be lower, but uh, I don't remember why they actually said the U.S. on that. Uh, so some of this information, Monterey Bay Aquarium has some really good resources where they actually do seafood watch. So they continually update recommendations for safe and sustainable seafood consumption. I wish I had some of those, those pocket guides with me. It's called Seafood Watch. And, and it's and also it's available as an resource. app. Yeah, it's available yeah, as an app so. for your smartphone. So if you guys are seafood consumers, go to the app store, either the iPhone or, or your, your um, Android app store, yep. and look for the Seafood Watch app. It's free, mm -hmm. it's updated regularly, and it's a, it's a good starting point for identifying fish that are okay to eat, fish that you should avoid, and fish that fall somewhere in between. Mm -hmm. Let's go all the way to the back in the, the plaid shirt there. Mm -hmm. So the question is, and Zach, you're picking up your mic. I don't know if you wanted to. Okay. <laughs> Um, so, so the question is, are there residual effects? It's certainly possible. Again, we don't, we don't know the fate of some of these toxins. So, uh, and the study you mentioned, so there's, there was a long-term, well, it wasn't necessarily a long-term study. It was a study that Ohio State did where they used long-term data from cancer registries and mortality records where they saw, they pulled out non-alcoholic associated liver disease and found differences in the mortalities in areas that ex around certain counties, and some of those counties experienced algal blooms. And that's a really good hypothesis building kind of study. It's what we call an epi, an, an ecological study. And it, it points out the relationship between this toxin and the liver. And again, we need further long-term studies to actually look at changes in liver enzymes, for example, in people who are chronically exposed over longer periods of time. Uh, and it's, again, one of the things that we're trying to fund and work on is this real threat of liver disease associated with microcystin. And, and I'll, I'll add one concerning thought. The state of Florida is not testing for any of this. So the state of Florida no. tests during cyanobacteria blooms for the presence of microcystins. Only during active blooms and only microcystins. So as Adam mentioned, there's hundreds if not thousands of different chemicals that are created by cyanobacteria. Some cyanobacteria are harmless, some are really toxic, some fall in between. Some are able to turn on and off their toxicity like a light switch, and we don't fully understand that process. But the state of Florida has picked the lowest hanging fruit, microcystins, arguably the easiest to detect, and they sample the water around the bright green patches, and that's it. So what they don't do is they don't sample the water away from the blooms. They don't sample any animals, whether we're talking shellfish or finfish, they don't sample the sediments during the blooms. And then once the bloom's done, there's no testing at all. So while we really don't know the answer, we also aren't gonna get an answer if the state of Florida or independent university researchers don't start to look at what is happening to the fish in our food web or the sediments in our estuary. And, and that's a concerning issue. We don't know whether these things stick around long term, but we know mercury does and we know how to test for mercury and there's regular testing protocols 
the, the state of Florida failing to test our estuaries for long-term effects of these cyanotoxins is pretty disheartening. Right there, sir. Yep. So the question is, what is the CDC doing, and why aren't they, they moving ahead more aggressively? And that's a really complex uh, answer because of the way the CDC operates. In a lot of cases, the CDC can't get involved unless they're invited by the state to get involved. Now, there's some folks, especially some folks that don't necessarily believe it's this big problem, so they're not inviting the CDC to the table. So my, my collaboration with the CDC is through some other routes where they're just providing technical assistance because they're not technically allowed to come down here and do studies. So my role has been bridging that gap and working with them to conduct these kinds of studies to actually get some of this stuff done. Um, but the, the short answer is politics, which is always the most frustrating answer sometimes. But, uh, oh. And money as well, yeah. So the question is, are we doing studies in other areas of Florida, uh, the other coast, and, and northern Florida? Uh, the short answer is, yeah, there's, there's some folks doing some studies. We went over during the blue-green and red tide blooms over uh, in Fort Myers area and sampled individuals there for our human health study. Uh, and we've got a couple of grants that we just submitted to, to fund comparison sampling between the west and the east coast in a couple different um, shark and ray species. So we're trying to build those comparative set, sites kind of studies because we, again, we want to look at the differences between some of these exposures between the coasts. So. But what about Northern Florida? That doesn't, doesn't impact the population. So Northern Florida, I mean, we're not doing any marine mammal or, or human studies north of the lake that, I, that I'm involved with. Mm -hmm. And we, we will have to build kind of control groups, right? So areas where they don't have recurrent blooms to be able to sample folks, to use them as kind of a baseline. So that, that, will, that will occur at some point, but funding, as you mentioned, uh, is, has been the biggest issue for that sort of l big long-term human health study. Just not getting any funding for them. Yeah, Since you set me up for the last comment, I'll let you ask. Yeah. Uh, for mercury, so a lot of folks are testing for mercury, and the state has uh, a program. So I've actually been working with Florida uh, Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission to do, so actually their research arm, FWRI, uh, to do the sampling. So they're already doing the, the mercury sampling. So we actually have access to that sort of data, but we don't have to physically do it ourselves. So that's one thing, you know, FWC is doing very, very well, and they've done consistently long-term is monitoring mercury. Right, that there. I'm from the Northeast, and back in the 1970s, I was working as an undercover engineer in the Department of Harvard Field Studies. Mm. And we, uh, we were actually trawling for lobster, uh, actually got the animals off of Logan Airport, about cleaning up the environment. So maybe some of the other fish we brought up here. No, it's a, it's, it's a great point. So, so what he was commenting on is some other studies that work that's been done up north. And again, it's, it's putting those, those pieces together, that data together, uh, making the public and the, the policymakers aware, and, and getting momentum. And, and like, like Zach mentioned earlier, we've got a lot of political momentum uh, moving forward. So what we need, we need careful, accurate research. We, we need to really be mix, making sure with our methods are correct. We're not making wild conclusions uh, to support folks doing the more uh, activism-based work and the policymakers to make the right decisions. Right there, man. So, 
Yes. Yeah, so the question is uh, about the results of the pilot study that we did where we were, we were doing nasal uh, blood and urine, urine sampling of, of residents. We don't, don't have a timeline because of the university uh, and because of our human subjects research office. And, and this is true for everywhere. It's not just FAU. We can't give individual results back to folks. Uh, and part of that is because we don't know what a particular concentration will even mean to, to the health of an individual because we're still researching that. So it's a large package of research that's coming together. And right now, again, because of the speed of some of the, the collaborators we've, we've had to work with and some of the issues with politics, moving with the CDC, things have been painfully slow. So we don't have a magic timeline when we'll be able to get the results out of certain folks, um, but we're working as hard as we can to get that. I, I wish I had an answer. I wish it was yesterday, um, but, but we're working as hard as we can. Ma'am, right there. Oof. Um, <laughs> I mean, we should certainly be careful, and we should always be careful, uh, particularly if you have like an open wound or an individual who's already immune compromised or has chronic liver disease, for example. You always need to be careful about the things that you're exposed to. So if you have any of those pre-existing conditions, I would certainly be very, very careful about interacting with the lagoon. And he man way back. Right, so, so I, I, I fish other places other than the river. So, so when I say that I eat fish that aren't from the river, they're fish that I've personally caught outside of the river. Right, but if I, if I buy fish at a restaurant, I'm buying fish from a restaurant that I feel has a strong reputation in our community, and I'm eating species that don't necessarily live in the river. So I can pick and choose species that are more of a, an offshore type species, um, fish that are caught in other areas. You, you do have to put a little bit of trust in the restaurants that you're eating from, but if I'm eating fish at a restaurant, it's usually going to be a place where I trust that the restaurant is being honest about the origin of the fish. I'm not going to list the names of specific restaurants, but I think you guys know there are certain places between here and Fort Pierce that are known for their, their chalkboard menu where every day they might have a few cuts of one fish and a few cuts of another that were brought in locally. If the menu is the same every single day, chances are they're buying frozen fish in huge quantities from somewhere else. But if, if I go to a local restaurant that has a changing menu every day, they're local caught, and then it's a species that I know is not typically a, a fish that's caught in the estuary, I feel a little bit more comfortable eating it. That said, anytime we eat anything, we're making a little bit of a risk. Guys, there are fruits and vegetables that can make us ill. There are commercially produced chicken, cattle that, that can make us ill. There's a lot of risks associated with everyday actions in our life. We're specifically talking about one risk here, eating seafood. But that doesn't take away from all the other risks and calculated decisions that we make on a daily basis. So in my case, last night, I ate some trigger fish and some triple tail. I know the trigger fish was not caught in the US. It was caught, it was caught in a Caribbean nation that doesn't have issues right now with cyanobacteria. That said, cyanobacteria is a global issue. This is not a Lake Okeechobee story. This is not a Florida story. This is not a United States story. This is a global issue. We have microcystis as our species that we talk about a lot, and other areas have microcystis. But there's also lots of other harmful types of cyanobacteria that are growing in other parts of the world. Anywhere you have warm water that's affected by nutrients, and not just fresh water, there are marine cyanobacteria as well, we worry about potential human contamination down the road. 
To get to the point of your question, sometimes we have to just put a little bit of faith and trust in the people we do business with and hope that they're being honest with us. <laughs> yeah, sure. Well, unfortunately, sometimes the ones that the ones that are okay from a cyanobacteria perspective might be risky from a mercury perspective. A good example, I know that kingfish aren't coming up into the estuary, but we worry about mercury with kingfish. So maybe eat smaller size kingfish. We know that tuna aren't gonna come up in the estuary, or dolphin, mahi-mahi aren't gonna come up in the estuary. So those are fish that we could, that we could eat without reasonably worrying about exposure. But I, I've got something for all of you to think about. Every year, millions and millions of small bait fish mature in our estuaries, and then they migrate out into the ocean. So I may be eating a fish that was caught offshore that ate fish that grew up in our estuary, and I would never know it. So this all goes into kind of the calculated risk you take anytime you eat anything. I'll throw another crazy one out there, and Adam will probably roll his eyes at me for saying this, uh. but we get our irrigation water out of freshwater bodies that sometimes have cyanobacterial blooms in them. What if you water a crop field with water that has cyanotoxins in it? Is it possible that your corn or your peppers or your green beans might be exposed to cyanotoxins. We don't know yet. We're, I, honestly, guys, we're at the tip of the iceberg when it comes to understanding the environmental implications of these problems and the human health issues associated with cyanobacteria. Mm. I wish I could give you a more straightforward answer than that, but it's incredibly complicated. It's the cyanobacteria and the toxins that they produce that, that I worry about, yes. So to, to follow up on that, there actually has, have been folks trying to do studies of contaminated water on fruits and vegetables. You're irrigating those to see if they're being taken up by the plants. So I guess the moral of the story is don't eat vegetables. I don't know. <laughs> Let's just eat chocolate and ice cream and call it a day. But, but don't eat sugar. Right, there we go. That gets a clap, there we go. Keep going. So let's go way in the back, sir, in the blue shirt. Oh, no, I, I, so the question was, he feels that maybe there isn't enough scientific evidence right now to stop the core from releasing cyanobacteria-tainted water. I disagree completely. One thing we know very clearly is that acute exposure to microcystins can cause lethal liver damage. Lethal liver damage in pets, lethal liver damage in us. So all this other stuff is, is additional layers of threats that we face, but there's no doubt that microcystin exposure can be really bad for us. We know this because microcystins sometimes contaminates freshwater drinking supplies. So there are standards set, both in the US and globally, that relate to how much microcystin we can drink before we start worrying about it. So to say that there's not enough evidence to lead the Army Corps of Engineers to, to maybe think twice about dumping this stuff in our estuary, that's not accurate. What we're worried about is how much more risk do we have above and beyond just the, the hepatotoxins what else do we have to worry about? How long does it linger? Is it in our food chain? But just based on that first layer of damage, there, there's certainly enough evidence right now to say that the Army Corps shouldn't continue these discharges. And I think that's one of the avenues that some of our elected officials are using to try to change the way that water in Lake Okeechobee is managed right now. Definitely. Thank you, Zach. Right there in the blue, man. So the question is about coral uh, in South Florida related to the discharges. Yeah. So I'm going to get a drink of water because he raised yeah. his hand again. Because um, so, so I, I, haven't, I haven't heard the, the coral story. There's, there's a disease affecting corals in Florida right now called stony coral tissue loss disease. We don't know exactly what's causing it. We don't know whether it's a, a fungal disease, a bacterial disease, a viral disease. Florida has a long history of coral diseases. Have any of you been scuba diving since like the 1970s or earlier? couple of you, you remember what our reefs are supposed to look like. We lost all of our Elkhorn and Staghorn coral in the late 70s and early 80s to one type of disease. That sort of simmered down. We've had subsequent waves of, of black plague, white plague, white band disease that are, that are hurting our corals. But most of them have been species specific and only affected one or two species at a time. Right now, for the last 
three or four years, we've been experiencing one of our worst coral disease outbreaks in the history of Florida, in modern history. I don't want to say the history of Florida. I, I'm not that old. But <laughs> what's happened, starting, starting I, I, don't quote me on this number, I think it was 2014, 2015, right after the Port of Miami deep, deep dredge project, some corals around Miami started to show this really rapid die-off. A lot of coral diseases progress slowly. Over the course of months, you watch the colony die. These corals were dying in the course of a week or two. One of my favorite corals that I used to visit all the time in South Florida was this tall, this big around. It was a big brain coral that was the size of a Volkswagen. The last time I saw it, it was alive and healthy. I checked it one more time, a couple months later, there was not a piece of it left alive. The whole Volkswagen-sized coral had died from this disease. It has now spread all the way up to the St. Lucie Reef, all the way south to Key West, so the whole Florida reef track is affected, and it's starting to show up in other places in the Caribbean. I read this article you did that linked it to Lake Okeechobee discharges, and it's wrong. I'm just gonna say that. That article is not accurate. This is a complicated issue. Coral ecologists still don't understand what's causing it. Coral ecologists have not said that it's caused by Lake Okeechobee discharges. It's affecting corals in areas that are not affected by Lake Okeechobee discharges. Are Lake Okeechobee discharges good for our reefs? Probably not. Are Lake Okeechobee discharges or water flowing through the Everglades that's not as clean as it needs to be affecting the Florida reef track and Florida Bay? Probably. But to link this catastrophic coral disease just to Lake Okeechobee discharges, there's probably more to the story than that. And I will tell you, this disease is affecting roughly 45 to 50% of the coral species that grow in our reefs, but the ones it's affecting, it's resulting in about a 90% mortality. And these are the big, monstrous reef-building corals, not the little puny ones. So there is a coral disease problem. It's probably linked to a whole lot of things, but it's, I, the, the reason I say this so carefully is, the argument that I heard was we shouldn't be sending water south. You know, the send it south mantra you've heard me repeat multiple times. We shouldn't be sending water south out of Lake Okeechobee because it's gonna kill the coral reefs. I have to say, that's not a valid argument. The water coming out of Lake Okeechobee would need to be cleaned through those filter marshes we talked about. I know many of you have been in here for lectures where we talked about filter marshes. That water wouldn't go into the Everglades or Florida Bay without first being cleaned to levels that won't affect the environment. So I, I, I think that was a little bit of a red herring article. We could talk more about it privately if you want. Yes? Well, the problem is, no, <laughs> but here's the problem. That article didn't say that discharges out of the Caloosahatchee and St. Lucie are bad. It said that sending water south, which is what we all want, sending water south is killing the reefs and the keys. And, and I would argue that there's not enough evidence to show that this particular disease outbreak is caused by water quality coming south from the Everglades. In fact, our, one of our bigger issues is not enough water coming out of the Everglades affecting salinity and the health of Florida Bay, which can lead to algae blooms, which can cause nutrients to spread out to the reef. Complicated story. Yeah. Uh, always be wary when we're talking about these very complex disease and health issues of one single source or one single input being the cause of it all, because these are very, very complex issues. Uh, and we wish there was one magic bullet to solve everything, but as Zach pointed out, there's, there's a lot of nuance here when it comes to understanding uh, some of our, our environmental issues here in Florida. So real quick, we had a question back here. Uh, uh, we'll get to you next. I see you waiting. Okay. We'll get to you next. We had a question here about sunscreen and coral reefs. It's a little divergent from today's topic, but I'll address it because it's been in the news a lot lately. This is another good example. Adam mentioned a few times tonight where, where there's evidence of something, but we don't have proof or there's limited studies, but we don't have a, a solid answer. There have been a few studies that have shown that sunscreen exposure in a few coral species can be detrimental to the health of the coral reef. So right now we're seeing large scale legislation aimed at banning certain types of sunscreen in certain areas. Hawaii's already acted on it. I wouldn't be surprised if Florida moves forward. Key West just had a municipal ban. Here's my concern with that. We don't have a whole lot of coral left. We also don't have a whole lot of exposure with coral reefs in our, in our area because we're not out there using them every single solitary day. We also have a really high risk of sun-related uh, sun cancers in our part of Florida. Does it make sense to ban sunscreen in an area like, like Fiji or Australia, the Great Barrier Reef, where you've got these huge reef tracks that are visited by tourists every single solitary day? Probably. Does it make sense for an entire state to ban sunscreen when your coral reefs are dying for a plethora of other reasons and we don't have evidence that, that all species are affected and, and all areas are affected. It's just another really good example of keep reading, stay on top of this, follow the news, read the newest stories. 
If you see a newspaper article, don't just read the newspaper article. Try to find the actual science that went into it. When I read a story about corals and sunscreen, I, I search the actual internet to find who wrote that article and what they had to say about corals and sunscreen. I don't take the word of the, the journalist who wrote that article at face value. And I would encourage all of you to do the exact same thing. There's no doubt that sunscreen is probably having an effect on corals in certain circumstances. But I, you know, maybe I'm like an emergency room doctor. I always like to triage things. And, and we've got much, much, much bigger concerns right now than sunscreen and straws. These are good stories because they bring attention to environmental issues. But folks, we need to make bigger changes in our lives than avoiding sunscreen and not using straws. Do you get it? I mean, they're good stories. They get people engaged. They get people to care about the environment. But it's not at the level that, that we need to be thinking of. We need to be thinking of major lifestyle changes to help our environment. Thank you. Do we have time for, we're good? Okay. Okay, finally. This better be a great question. It was worth the wait, right? <laughs> Mm -hmm. You didn't mention manatees at all being affected. Is that because they're not being affected because of their diet or, or why? Uh, part of it's because I'm not really a manatee guy. Uh, <laughs> I'll be honest. Uh, no, we, no, we haven't seen large scale, necessarily large scale mortalities like we do with the red tide. Red tides are particularly devastating to some of these, these uh, the manatees. But we're still monitoring it, and that's really under FWC. And some of our collaborators with FWC, again, understanding their exposure as well. They're certainly at, at risk. They're breathing in the air. They're consuming, directly consuming some of these, these products. So there, there is a concern. Um, but Zach, is there uh, anything else you want to yeah, add? Just, you know, Adam said I'm not a manatee guy, and you guys laughed. It doesn't mean he doesn't like them personally. But as researchers, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we, don't, we don't have unlimited budgets and unlimited timelines to study every animal we want to. So very often, you'll find not just an individual researcher, but maybe even an entire lab or an entire university that only specializes in certain things. Somebody asked earlier about testing north of the lake. There are probably other universities that are testing for these same kinds of things all over the US, but in our part of Florida, Harbor Branch and Adam can't be everywhere at every time studying every single animal. So oftentimes you might have an interesting question that relates to a different species than you work with. You might not even have a permit to go out and sample that animal. So it's not as simple as just, you know, well, yeah. let's sample everything. It's complicated. Yeah, and FWC, again, the, the permitting for marine mammals goes through a whole different process for dolphins and whales than it does for manatees, um, which goes through, we go through the federal process for dolphins and whales, FWC and the state handles the manatee work. So we don't have all those permits, um, but we certainly collaborate and help out when we can. For example, I have two manatees that are coming to my necropsy lab tomorrow. I won't personally be doing the necropsies, um, but we say engage, but like Zach said, we just don't have, I need to sleep eventually uh, every once in a while, maybe Sundays. Um, so again, we, we don't have answers, but there's, FWC has a lot of great resources for, for manatee information. That Adam, certainly find. I think we have time for maybe two more questions. I mean, we've had a great 45 minute oh, yeah. discussion here. Let's see if we can answer. Let's go with this one right here. I've, I've got, got personal preference here. We'll give, give Chris no, a chance okay. to ask a question. <laughs> then you've got to answer it if it's a tough question, so. So one of, something that I've heard, again, I don't, I don't personally study some of this, this work, but that those cells, when they hit the salt water, a lot of times they lyse, so they burst open, and they might be releasing more toxin, toxin when they're about to die and get into those high saline environments. So it could, again, I'm not, I'm not saying we know or it is, but it could actually, that, that interface there where the salinity changes enough uh, could be a real concern in that particular area when those cells just kind of burst and release everything that's inside them. So that's part of what we're studying, but it it might dissipate a little bit. It certainly the the dilution factor is in play there, um, and again we're tracking these blooms as they move. They they start to die when they hit that saline water, and uh, again it's another. We need more funding to study it uh, and, and understand it. 
I know I keep ending my answers with the same thing, but it's, it's really true. We're, we're at a point where we need, we have good information, but we need a lot more uh, to continue to answer some of these more complex questions that, that folks have. What about the EPA's role in all this? I don't want to make any comments about our, our uh, administration. Um, <laughs> so maybe we'll just. He's looking <laughs> at me. I you know, all, all I can say is that we're in a very interesting time for the environment right now. At the state level, it feels like things are maybe getting a little bit better. At the federal level, Definitely. I'm not so sure. Uh, we would need some pressure on the EPA in order for them to start looking at this as a, as a massive health risk. That pressure may come from some of our federal representatives here in Florida, and that's, that's the best hope that I have. Mm -hmm. I, I think it would have to be the governor of Florida, but then at, at, at the federal level, our, our federal representatives work very closely with our governor as well, and I think that type of relationship is the, is the strongest it's been in terms of the environment in a very long time. Definitely. Mm -hmm. it, it, so, far, so far, it seems like it. We'll, we'll see, but it, so far, it seems like it. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, guys, we're gonna have to wrap it up with that. Can I get a huge round of applause for Adam? Thank you. Before, Before we all say goodbye for tonight, I want to thank you again for making this lecture series wonderful. I, I just did the quick math. We're somewhere between uh, 14 and 1,500 people for the season at our lectures. That's a huge chunk of our community. You guys care about learning. I'm going to keep bringing in great speakers, and hopefully you'll get something out of each and every one of our lectures each year. Uh, I hope you guys have heard a little bit about our growth as an organization. Maybe some of you haven't. We are embarking on a major expansion project. We hope to break ground this spring on a brand new giant building that's going to have incredible aquarium exhibits, interactive educational exhibits, high-tech and low-tech educational and learning tools, a full classroom, a dedicated science classroom. It's going to be incredible. Check our website. We've got some schematics online. I think you'll be really impressed to see what kind of growth we're going to experience. Our last new exhibit at Florida Oceanographic Society is almost 15 years old. That's our 700,000 gallon outdoor aquarium. This is our next big leap as an organization, and it's gonna allow us to do an even better job of educating you and the children in our community about the environment here in Florida. That's enough talking for tonight. You guys have been incredible. I'll see you again, hopefully, hopefully not in a year. Hopefully I'll see you guys sooner than a year. But for those of you that are seasonal, we'll see you again next January right here at the library. Have a great summer, everybody. Take care.